you are listening to the Invitation Church podcast. To learn more about Invitation Church, visit us online at invitation605.com. You can also download our app on iTunes and Google Play by searching for Invitation 605. Yeah, four L's. Pick that up, turn it over. Lay it down right over that London trip down. Okay. Nice song. Oh, well, that'd be a good idea, yeah. <laughs> Mythological hero Achilles. I can't accept that. Okay. Shovel. I'll solve. Yeah. Mythological hero Achilles. Yeah, that's it. Uh, oh, boy. Well. Yeah, been there? Like a moment of pressure, right? Like it's a little bit different. Like our teachers in the room can talk about the moment when you're writing something on the board and all of a sudden you can't remember how to spell the certain word or do the letters out of order. And it only happens when you're up in front. Like it only happens when the lights are on. Like the whole dynamic, the whole context changes and the disciples the apostles are in a moment in Acts chapter 5, a moment of pressure. And, and here's what happens. Uh, the apostles have already been told, like, stop talking about Jesus. Like, we have a king, we have a ruler, his name is Caesar. Like, there's evidence of his power. There's all of these people that are working for him and collecting taxes and the, the peace of Rome, the Pax Romana is evidenced by all of these soldiers, by all of the military personnel throughout Jerusalem. And, and Rome says, you know, these people who follow this God named Yahweh, like you can kind of do whatever you want as long as it doesn't cut in line in front of Rome. But the moment it cuts in line in front of Rome, we're going to have a problem and we're going to put you down. And so they had a whole plan for how they were going to do this. Rome wanted to keep the main thing the main thing. So you can sing, you can pray, you can go to the temple. Just don't get in the way of Rome. And what happens is that the apostles do the things that Jesus asked them to do. They continue the ministry of Jesus. So what happens, what that means is, People are being healed. Like there's freedom that is taking root in planet Earth in a significant way, in a powerful way. And they don't like that very much. And so we're told in Acts chapter 5 that the high priests and his associates, whenever there's somebody in power, there's always associates that go with that person in power. So it's not just Rome that's coming against the apostles, but now it's God's people. It's the high priest and the associates. And if you notice in Acts chapter 5, they're filled with something. Luke tells us that they're filled with jealousy. And jealousy is a powerful engine. Like jealousy can do some things. Jealousy can tear down some things. Jealousy can make some things happen. And so the apostles don't stop talking about Jesus. Because Jesus has so radically transformed the way they think about everything. It wasn't going to church that did that. It was an encounter with Jesus that did that. He changed the game for them. Like they, they couldn't hear, they couldn't unhear the words that they, that they had learned from Jesus. But the religious leaders are filled with jealousy. They don't like that very much. And so they arrest the apostles. And they bring them to jail. And then it's nightfall. And what happens is an angel of the Lord unlocks the jail cell, and so they get out. So then in the morning, where do you think they are? They're back teaching and preaching. They're talking about Jesus. 
that the angel of the Lord makes it possible for them to come out. And if this sounds like the Easter story, Luke's doing that on purpose. He's wanting to see that bringing people out of captivity is not something that God just did one time. It's something that God wants to do again and again and again. And so we notice that the jail is still there, but the apostles aren't in the jail anymore. In the same way, like the tomb was not destroyed, just what was holding the person in the tomb is no longer there. There's a new thing happening. And so the religious leaders are angry, they're upset. They go bring the apostles back, throwing them back in jail. This is like the cat that just keeps kind of rolling back around. You're trying to get it out and it comes back. This is the moment that these religious leaders are in. And they say, we told you to stop talking about Jesus. Like, don't make me come back there. Mile marker 72 on your way up north. And they're like, I I know. I know we talked about it. I know you told us to stop talking about Jesus, but we just have to obey him. Like, we're not actually that concerned with obeying Rome. We're not actually that concerned with obeying the religious structure of Israel. We're concerned with obeying Jesus. Like, we're less concerned with the teachings of the church, and we're more concerned with the teachings of Jesus. We're less concerned with the choices the church is making, and we're more concerned with the way of life that Jesus has laid out for us. And he told us to talk about him. So we're just not going to waste our time talking about other things than that which we have been told to talk about. So he said, go and talk about me. And when people don't accept your message, know that that's going to be part of it. You're going to have to shake the dust off the sandals and go to the next town and do what? Keep doing the stuff I asked you to do. Keep talking about me because when you talk about me, people hear. And when people hear, especially for the first time, something amazing and incredible happens. My spirit does stuff. My spirit, going all the way back to Genesis 1, forms and fills in the chaos in the confusion, in the doubt, in the hardship, in the uncertainty, in the pain, in the captivity, in the ruins, something happens. And so the disciples again are told to stop talking about Jesus, and then there's an old man that stands up. And he's going to talk on the behalf of the apostles, and that's where we want to pick it up tonight. So we just walked through, I don't know, 26 verses. So here's Acts chapter 5, more than that, 30-some verses. Here's Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 34. But a Pharisee, but a Pharisee who named Galamiel, a teacher of the law. If you're wondering about Galamiel, like who taught the apostle Paul? Galamiel did. Like, he was helpful and instructive in his life. A teacher of the law who was honored by all of the people. So, if you've been in a space and there's a question, there's a concern, and people's eyes tend to go to somebody, this is Galmiel. He stood up in the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is like all of the religious elders, all of the people who are in charge. And he ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. So this is the moment like, hey, go out there so I can talk to your mom. Moment. Then he addressed them, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thutis appeared, claiming to be somebody And about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all of his followers were dispersed. And it all came to nothing. And after him, Judas, 
The Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all of his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. Where have we heard of that before in the Bible? This is God bringing people out of captivity, carrying us out. For in their purpose, Moses, that's where we've heard it before, just so you know. For in their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. If it's powered by their own desire, their own strength, their own perspective, their own words, it's going to crash and fail because we've seen it before. But, verse 39, if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them, mostly. I mean, they called the apostles in and had them flogged. So, one less than 40 times. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name day after day in the temple courts and from house to house. They never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. So they're in a moment of pressure been told what they're supposed to do. Stop teaching. And they don't. And they're brought in. Stop teaching. And they don't. And they're brought in. And they're flogged. Stop teaching. And they don't. Like this is, there's this like back and forth thing that Luke wants us to see. That these disciples are convinced to follow Jesus like whatever it means. And it's interesting in Galamiel's speech, He refers to Jesus earlier than what we read in these two terms that don't show up very much in the Scripture. One, Savior, which we hear a lot, like Jesus is Savior. Like there's a saving work that Jesus is about on planet Earth, this word soter. But there's this other word that only shows up a couple times, and it's this word archegos, and it means prince or hero. And in the ancient world, in the Greco-Roman world, like these little kids, like how do you teach your kids about courage if like you're a Greco-Roman person? You tell them stories. You tell them stories about people like Achilles and Hercules and Odysseus. But Jesus is a different kind of hero, and what makes him different, what helps him stand apart from those heroes, is not that he has power, because those figures also have power, they're heroes, but Jesus is a different kind of hero, because it's not that he obtains power, that he has power, that he discovers power, it's what Jesus does with his power. And what he does with his power is he extends it. He gives it away. He calls his people to live in light of not their own power. Like, do these things, not in your own name. Like, in your own ability, in your own... No, but in mine. I want you to carry my name, we hear in the book of Acts. And part of what that means, if we carry the name of Jesus, we also have the opportunity to carry his power. And I think what Luke wants us to see in all of this, because remember, this book is written by a follower of Jesus. Like it's written by somebody who had meals with Jesus, who heard Jesus sing, who watched him pay attention to people, watched him be interrupted, and spend time with little kids and talk to them and people who are sick and hurting and depressed and anxious and people who have been cast aside. Like Luke's watched all of this unfold and 
I think one of the things he wants us to see is that walking with Jesus will require us to stand before the Sanhedrin. Like, it's part of what it's going to mean to follow Jesus. Like, you're not going, I'm just letting you know, like, you're not going to be able to, like, eat a s'more without it, like, getting on you. Like that marshmallow, it's going to find this part of your hand. Like, you're not going to be able to do that. You're not going to be able to spend time around a campfire and then go to work or go somewhere else and for the whole place to not smell where you've been. Like, you won't be able to do it. And I think in the same way, Luke wants us reading this, these thousands of years after this happens, to get really clear about following Jesus. That to say yes to following Jesus is also saying yes to being in moments of pressure, like standing before people who don't like it. Standing before people who would prefer that you stop talking about the Jesus way, that you stop living out the Jesus way and instead bow down to Rome. Stop asking, what would Jesus have me do in this moment? What would Jesus have me do here? And start asking, I don't know, what does Caesar want me to do? Like, what does Caesar think is beautiful and trustworthy and meaningful? Like, what Caesar give me purpose? Instead of the Jesus way powering purpose in my life. And I just think the only reason that, that God would promise to give the apostles power from on high. Like, that's what we hear in Acts chapter 2, isn't it? But you will receive power when? When the Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Not just here, but to the ends of the earth. The only reason that Jesus would promise to fill his people with with power is because you would need the power. Otherwise, what's the point of promising that? Power for what? That's a great question. I think one of the things the power is for, I think the power is for standing. Standing where? Standing how? Standing when? Standing under pressure. That's one of the things the power is for. He gives it away. Because we're all going to be in moments brought before some kind of Sanhedrin, and no, I'm not talking about going to City Hall and standing in front of Mayor Paul. But I'm talking about relational pressure, and you're like, ooh, you were in my house earlier today. Like when you are experiencing some kind of relational pressure point, whether it's in your home or outside of your home or within you, I just believe you're going to need power from on high. Because I don't think in and of yourself we have what it takes to stand. I think we could talk about financial pressure. When you're like, I've been to kindergarten so I know how to count. It's not looking good. I think the Jesus way wants to empower us to stand in that moment. And I think we could pass around this microphone tonight. I'm not trying to make anybody nervous, so I'm not going to do it, but I think we could tell stories of relational pressure. And the only way we could keep showing up in that relationship is because we've received power from on high. We're not naming names in the place today. We're not telling stories, but you know. You've stood in that place with that person in your family, with that boss, with that person on the internet, and the only way you've had the power to stand is because you received it from on high. You received it outside of yourself, and financial pressure just was not, we're not going to make this work. And it's not that there were these like heavenly dollars falling from the sky, but no, but you had power to stand in the middle of that moment. It's one of the promises of Jesus that when you go before the Sanhedrin, 
You don't stand there alone. You stand there with what? You stand there with a name. Because that's what the religious leaders are so upset about. Like, stop talking about this name. Stop talking about this Savior. Stop talking about this hero. We already have a Savior and we have a hero. Talk about him. And the disciples were like, no. And I think there's a couple options when we're under pressure. Option one is that we turn inward when we're under pressure. I don't know if there's any like Star Wars people in the house. I am not. So don't ask me to explain the story. Don't ask me how many movies I've seen. Don't. No, the one with Jar Jar Binks. I've seen that one. But Obi-Wan Kenobi, I know a little bit about him. He said, let go of your conscious self and act on instinct. Your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. So one option that we have under pressure is to turn inward. And doing that just, you know, really denies the fact that bad things can and do happen. So to turn inward is really to choose ignorance in order to be courageous. So that's one option before us like turn inward. Another option is that we turn outward for courage. And this is what we see in Jesus, right? In like the Garden of Gethsemane. Like he's deeply troubled, the gospel writers say. And he's got the three people who are closest to him throughout the whole ministry. Like they're probably close enough to hear him pray, but they've fallen asleep. And so he cries out to his father like, hey, if you've got a plan B, if there's an exit ramp, if if there's another way out of this deal, this would be a good time for you. I've got a microphone for you to tell me, but not what I will, but what you will. In Hebrews chapter 12, we hear a little bit about this moment. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. So the author of Hebrews wants us, that's where our, he wants our eyes. Or she, we don't really know. The pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So there's Joy that was set before him. And I don't know if you have read this verse before, if you've thought about this verse before, if you've considered this verse before, and being like, what's the joy about? Because wasn't Jesus with God? Isn't he God? Wasn't, Wasn't it like in some ways difficult to step down into human history? Like what's the joy about? Like, what joy could he not, did he not have in heaven that he could only have on this side of suffering? Because the thing that powered Jesus' response is this joy that is set before him. Like, what was he looking at as he pondered the incarnation and his life and the suffering? Like, it wasn't what he experienced. We know that because he asked if there was another way. So it's not that Jesus is excited about what's before him. He's under pressure. So much so that the gospel writers tell us that he's sweating blood and there's anguish and deep sadness and turmoil within the heart of Jesus. The one who did all this miraculous stuff but there's a joy set before him. And I think one option, I'm not giving any answers out tonight, like candy bars, but I think one option is the joy is about sharing the relationship with the world that he had with his father. Property values in heaven, pretty good. Relational closeness in heaven, pretty strong. And the joy set before Jesus is sharing with the world what he has with the Father. 
even when he's under pressure. And we're not going to be able to follow Jesus and not experience those moments. And I think for a lot of us tonight, like, we're in one of those now. When we walk out of this room, we've got choices about how we're going to respond, where we're going to turn. We're going to turn somewhere. We're going to turn inward, and we're going to deny, and or we're going to turn outward. And what's beautiful about turning outward is that you get to lean not just on what you have. You have at your disposal not just what you have, but what Jesus has breathed into the community. So when someone else knows about it, there's strength there, isn't it? Because it's not just about what you have in your pocket. Not just about what you've walked through, what you have in your life. And that's one of the blessings of turning outward. Like there's good gifts, but it's scary, it's risky. There's uncertainty with that. And of course, it's easy tonight, but like, well, you gave us the example of Jesus, so I guess we don't have an option. We just have to do what he did. And I guess, church, what I want us to see tonight is that the creator of the universe like paved the way to turning toward the people that were around him in his darkest moment. And he's a model for us in that way. He's an example for us in that way. Because Luke wants to tell us, you're not going to be able to follow Jesus without standing before the Sanhedrin. And so the choice is not, am I going to stand before the Sanhedrin in a moment of pressure? The question is going to be like, where am I going to turn with that? I invite the band up as we close tonight. One of the beautiful examples of this is when he, Jesus is seated with his disciples at one last meal in an upper room that some random person owned. I often wonder about that conversation, like, hey, not can I use your bathroom? Can we use that, like, room you have upstairs? Sure. Unnamed person. And they climb up the stairs, they do whatever, and they start to sit around. And Jesus, you know, we have the meal, they sing a hymn, and then takes the bread and breaks it, and it's like, hey, this is my body that's been given for you. Takes some wine that they were drinking and says, this is my blood that's, that's given for you. For the joy that's set before me of you coming into contact and knowing the beauty of a relationship that I have with my Father, I want to share that with you. That's why I've come. That's why my spirit has been hovering in this place, because there's a work of power and grace and beauty that my spirit wants to do. And that's where we are tonight. Just as a reminder, as we talked about at the very beginning, that there's a good and purposeful work that God's doing in this place in each and every person. And we come to the table tonight remembering that we have a Savior who has breathed under pressure. And the table's a good reminder of that. But the pressure does not bury him because he is the God who is victorious over the pressure, over the scandal of his death on a cross. And so tonight is about remembering that. Remembering about where Jesus has turned, that he's turned toward his Father, and turning toward his Father has caused him to turn toward his people. And so there's this prayer that we like to pray just to help us remember what this is all about. And it just goes like this. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. And it's to be made ready for those who love him and who want to love him more. So come, come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you have not been for a very long time, 
you who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come, because it is the Lord who invites you. I'm going to invite the Timmermans up. Tom and Mel, they're going to serve on this side. And if just kind of you know how this works, there's you kind of come down the center and kind of go exit on this side. There are two small ice cream buckets on the tables in the back, and that's just where you can put your cup. Some of you have been like, okay, I love that we're doing this, but where do we put the little cup? That's where you put the cup, all right? So, um, and then uh, over here, uh, I'm going to invite Bill Heinrich up. He's going to help me serve on this side, and I'm going to have some, two kinds of crackers. One's a lighter colored cracker, one's a darker colored cracker. The lighter colored cracker is the gluten-free cracker. The darker colored cracker is the gluten-full one, all right? I don't know how to say that. All right. And I'm just going to ask that during this time, and if you say, well, when do we take it? I want you to grab it. You want to go back to your seat, and in a moment of reflection and prayer, you can wait. You can take it right away. And we're all taken in the same place, in the same way, as a symbol of our unity. Let me pray for us. Uh, God, we are grateful tonight uh, for your way. Uh, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have been uh, given tonight to gather ourselves uh, around this table, this table that stretches all the way to the beginning of human history, all of the way back to Egypt, all the way back to the dark places of our lives, and a table that stretches all the way into eternity, so that what's spoken at the table speaks into what has happened and speaks into future, speaks to what we are still awaiting. And so thank you, Jesus, for coming. Uh, thank you, Jesus, for the resurrection power that you have extended to us. And we're seated at the table, trusting, trusting your way, trusting your word, trusting your heart for us and for the world. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us on the Invitation Church podcast. I want to encourage you to take the message that you just heard and receive every part of it. Every promise from God, every declaration of his great love for you, every word of hope, every reminder that you have been made for more. Allow what you've heard to take root in your soul to allow Jesus to do the deep work that only he can do. I also want to encourage you to be part of what we are doing here at Invitation as we invite people to live the way of Jesus. Go to the app and become a regular giver, an investor in the story that God is writing in this place. Also, if you found the message meaningful, we'd love to have you share it with someone else as you partner with us in carrying the message beyond the walls of the church. I want to thank you for being here with us. Grace and peace.